It was January 2020, early in the COVID-19 pandemic, and Adrienne Cardin was seven months pregnant with her fourth baby. About the same time, I was talking to my mom on the phone, and she said, hey, you know, your grandpa was born in the middle of the pandemic. It was 1918, during the Spanish flu pandemic, and Alberta Jacobs was pregnant with her fourth baby, Adrienne's grandfather. Both women were 36 years old, and the similarities don't end there. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. As we all lose count of the months and days spanned by this current pandemic, I can't even tell you how excited I am to be able to share Adrian's incredible story of hope and connection across a century from one mother to another, and from one pandemic to another. So I'm going to do things backwards, save the introductions for a little later, and let Adrian jump right in. In January of 2020, when China kind of became this viral tinderbox, I was eight months pregnant and kind of like watching the news obsessively, like many people were, just refreshed the New York Times coronavirus page over and over again. This was When people who were pregnant were not being permitted to have their partners uh, go to the hospital with them. And this is my fourth birth. So I was less nervous about that because I know what birth is like. I've done it three times prior. I mean, of course, every time is a little anxiety inducing. Anyway, just I was more anxious, honestly, about what was happening with the pandemic at that point, (laughs) because there were so many unknowns. My best friend's were living in New York and my friend who lived in Queens said she could just hear sirens 24 hours a day driving in her neighborhood, like COVID patients. So it was just the unknown was so worrisome to me. And I remember sending my husband to Target at the beginning of when it hit our state and he came home with all of these items we normally don't get like macaroni and cheese in a cup that you warm up in a cup. And I was like, what are you doing? He said, this was all that was left. You don't understand. It was like communist Russia. Like there was nothing on the shelves at all. I got what I could. Um, So this was sort of the background to this. And about the same time I was talking to my mom on the phone and she said, Hey, you know, your grandpa was born in the middle of the pandemic. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, he was born in the 1918 pandemic and he was kept in a cardboard box next to the stove to keep him warm. (laughs) And he survived the the Spanish flu, but he had ants and stuff who died and lots of the townspeople died, like one in 10, I think people in his town died in the 1918 flu. And I thought this is, might be something worth writing about. Adrian had wanted to write a book of poetry since she was a little girl. Maybe this was the topic she'd been waiting for. Maybe became definitely when Adrian discovered a call for entries for a project called Art for Uncertain Times from the Center for Latter-day Saint Art. She applied, she got the grant, and she started researching her great-grandmother's life. I was so excited. So I had some grant money and I had uh, an incentive to really write. So I decided I was gonna tell these dual stories of me and my grandmother, Alberta, my great-grandmother, who gave birth to my grandfather. So then I began the journey of doing my research and learning more about her. She died really young in her 50s. So there are no living relatives who really remember her well. My mom didn't really know her or any of my aunts and uncles. So I was sort of working from a blank slate and I had a comment from an aunt offhand that said, hey, your great grandmother was also a poet. And I said, what? Yes, you heard that right. Adrian and Alberta both gave birth to their fourth and final child during a pandemic at age 36, and they were both poets. The plot thickens. And she said, yeah, she published all this poetry. Do you know where it is? No, no one knows where it is. I, you know, looked a couple of local university archives, felt like I had some leads, nothing panned out. Anyway, finally, I found a collection at the University of Utah's digital archives that had um, all of this stuff that had been donated about a decade ago by some distant cousin or something. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't see the text but I could see the names of the boxes and how they were labeled. And one said poems. And I clicked on that. And one said there are poems about motherhood and things like that. And I thought, this is an incredible discovery. 
I have to get my hands on it. And instead of me writing her story, I'm going to let her tell her story as much as she can. If this is what I hope that it is. And it was, it was like this amazing, amazing blessing. So the only problem was the library was closed because of COVID for months and months and months. So I couldn't get my hands on any of this stuff. I was bothering the the research librarian in special collections like every other day. Like, when can I, can I come in? Like, can you go in and digitize it for me? Um, anyway, she said, I can't even get in. It's completely shut down to everyone. <laughs> so patiently waiting, just like knowing I had this potential gold mine. I finally got in at the end of the summer and I sent my husband up and cause I have a nursing baby at that point, he digitizes everything. Um, and I'm able to see all of her poems and she does have poems about motherhood. And she had written an editorial in her local newspaper about the pandemic and the war, which was also happening at the same time. So all of this really great material. So then my job was to just edit it together to write my story of giving birth, which I did in April, like the first day that the nurses were required to wear PPE. Um, so everyone at the hospital <laughs> was kind of fumbling around too that day. And I wrote her story with mine and it became this really cool unintentional family history project where I learned so much about her and, and my grandfather from her perspective who I'd only known, you know, he died when I was in my late teens. So I didn't know him super well. Anyway, I, it became this really cool thing. It morphed into something way more than I thought it would be. Like, I felt like I threw my little nugget in and it was multiplied. Like the universe loved me and was bestowing this gift on me or my, or the spirit of my great grandmother. So I now keep a picture of her on my desk when I write her name's Alberta, because I didn't know know anything about her and now I know the most personal and wonderful things about her because of this process. So the book is called And Still Birth, Death and New Life in a Pandemic and I say that it's a collaboration between me and my great-grandmother Alberta. Let me interrupt here to rave about this little book. I read it first on the Kindle app because I had to get my hands on it fast after I heard Adrian's story. I promptly ordered the hard copy from Amazon. I read it for the second time right before the interview with Adrian, and it was all I could do to pull myself together for the call. First of all, this is an emotional book of poetry. And second of all, I was having a fangirl moment. So excited to meet the woman who wrote stanzas like this one, which could have been written in either century. This virus cheats us of funerals. No hams, nor cakes, nor verse. There are abbreviated goodbyes and remembrances. Quiet rites. I am not permitted graveside. I mean, this book. Even the format is beautiful. All of the poems written either by Alberta herself or by Adrian in Alberta's voice are left justified, and all the poems written by Adrian are right justified. In many poems, the stanzas go back and forth between their voices and across the page, and sometimes words in the middle of the page intertwine their two voices. Don't worry, you'll hear a complete poem written by both Adrian and Alberta at the end of this episode. But first, let's get to know a little bit more about Adrian. I'm Adrian Carden. I am the mother of four precocious children, ages 15 months to nine. I am passionate about doing everything in life. <laughs> life is a buffet for me. I sort of have a creative wanderlust and I want to try everything. I I saw a meme last week that said, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And I thought, you don't know me. I want to do it all. Um, I'm very passionate about the arts. My husband and I both work in the arts. Obviously this book that I've written is a probably testament to that. Um, I love the national park system. We have an annual pass to the national parks for our family. So we try to do a couple a year at least. And living in Utah, we have the opportunity to visit a lot of national parks since we have five in the state. Um, I'm passionate about food. I love to cook. And I, except I will say because of COVID, I am a little tired of cooking because I have had all of my children home for almost two years (laughs) and have cooked so many meals that I will be looking forward to school going back in the fall. So I'll at least have one meal less a day to prepare for most of my children. (laughs) 
Isn't she just delightful? Now let's get back to my conversation with her, where you'll hear me fangirl away. Incredible that you started the project before you knew those poems existed. I cannot even. Yeah, and nobody knew they like my my aunt sort of knew she had written poetry, but no one knew any of this stuff. And the cool thing is now all of this stuff has been digitized by me, <laughs> scanned on a high resolution scanner and digitized. So everyone now has access to this where they didn't before. So maybe this was her way of getting her stuff more permanently <laughs> available to people to read. You know, as I, as I was reading this, I, this doesn't happen very often to me. There, it was like joy tinged with jealousy because I wished that I had just been part of the process of writing it. I was jealous of you getting to go through that process of discovering your grandma's letters and poems and being able to have those words come to you. Like I, I, that doesn't happen very often where I'm so jealous of the process, like how much it must have meant to go through that. Yeah. Usually the process is not the fun part <laughs> for right? me, the grueling, boring, like tedious part. And it was real, like you say, it was a really special experience. Like I just felt like, I don't know, illuminated somehow. And I have no doubt that she, yeah, as you say, is working behind the scenes. And one of the cool things that came from this too was like, of course, we soon, we started to unravel more of what this virus was and how we could prevent ourselves from getting sick and how we could treat it, things like that. So it became a little less scary, but at the beginning, it was very scary. And through reading some of this stuff, it made me realize like nothing is new. We've done all of this stuff before. People have, have been having babies through wars, through natural disasters. People have been giving birth in periods of lots of you know, great death and destruction. Like we're so insulated in some ways in our convenient modern society that we that this stuff shakes us in a way that it probably didn't shake our ancestors as much. Now they still lost relatives. Like my great grandmother lost her sister to the Spanish flu, you know, weeks before she gave birth and she couldn't go to the funeral, things like that. So it was still hard for them. But I think knowing that this is something that people have been doing for ever <laughs> sort of gave me comfort that it was going to be all right. And I think that was even more than the, me being able to finally write my first book of poetry, which was a goal of mine. I think that was even more of the blessing for me in doing this project was realizing my small place in the universe <laughs> and that, you know, everything comes around. So it's all cyclical <laughs> and there's a lot we can learn from the people who have gone before us. And there's a lot that they probably would want to tell us. So here's her way to tell me to chill out. You're going to be okay. You'll be able to give birth in a hospital with clean water. <laughs> you know, things like it could be a lot worse. It gives me a lot of perspective. That's so interesting. So if we were to zoom out and generalize, why do you think it is important for us to learn these stories of our ancestors and connect with people who've come before us? There, I mean, everything, every, it's, it's important for every reason. <laughs> I think it makes us more resilient. At least it does for me. So on my mom's side, which is where this grandmother comes through, I'm through her, that lineage. A lot of the family history work and genealogy has been done. A lot of people have chosen to take that upon themselves. And I felt like this is sort of done. There's nothing more I can uncover. And I think like you talk about the process was really cool. I think having to look for it really, really hard, like dig, like be actively searching made a difference than if this stuff would have just passively been handed to me. And I think it changed me learning about my ancestors. And I think it like really illuminated to me who they were that I share bloodline with them like and it, apart from all of our coincidences like she was 36 at the time giving birth to her fourth and final child like I was 36 at the time giving birth to my fourth and final child both were boy like so many are parallel you know so such parallel stories I think it gave me a lot of confidence and resilience 
and perspective. <laughs> yeah. How did it impact your, your approach to motherhood? How did it impact the, the way you mother? So she wrote a lot of essays too. So she was a poet, but she also wrote, you know, editorials and essays. The editorial she wrote was around Christmas time, kind of when the Spanish flu was the worst, like the, during the first wave, or maybe it was the second wave, but it was the first time it had sort of hit their hometown. And she was, turns out like pretty political <laughs> where Maybe it's because we live in a world that's so politic so feels so politicized now, but I don't think it's like when I think about my grandparents, like they just had cookies or what like whatever. They weren't they didn't have political lives. They didn't get into disagreements with people on the internet <laughs> because they didn't have the internet. But I mean, do you know what I mean? They didn't yeah. that wasn't a part of them. And realizing through this process, like um, like she was pretty political and especially in the time that she was writing these things, 1918, like, I guess this was around suffrage, the suffragettes and things, but I had never seen her as that. <laughs> and, and the way she impacted her children and my grandfather, the baby who was born in the pandemic, like I, at the same time, uncovered some of his writings and he was, had written a lot of letters to the editors and he was super political. <laughs> And you get to see this, uncover the side of them that they have passed on to their children. And because we came through such a contentious election on top of a pandemic, and we had discussions with our children about, you know, why, why are we voting for this candidate and not this candidate? What do we think is the right thing for this country? Like we had to have those conversations. I think a gift she gave to me is realizing she didn't have to censor herself. Like she could be her whole political self and all like firebrand self and all and teach her children those things. In addition to normal, like mom jobs. I think that I gleaned some of that from her and how I approached talking about politics and stuff with my kids during the election last year. That was kind of a cool unexpected little blessing that came out of that as well. I think she taught me how to do that. And I think that's changed probably how I'll continue to mother. I don't think I'm going to shy away from controversial topics with my children. I think we're going to sort of face them, face them head on kind of like she did. And maybe I'll even write an editorial. <laughs> of course, another of my questions is how Adrian possibly wrote and researched this book with all her kids home from school and a newborn baby. The other blessing of COVID was my husband, <laughs> this is, sounds strange to say it was a blessing, but had a lot of his projects canceled. He's a filmmaker. So a lot of stuff just got canceled or postponed. So I had the time where he could watch the children so I could write, which would not have happened in another year. I would not have found that time during the day to write instead of exhausted hours at night to write. So I think that was good for them too, to realize like, this is mommy's writing time. She's writing about the baby, baby Graham, who's, which is my son's name, who was born last year. And we got to leave her alone. Daddy's in charge. <laughs> let mommy, let mommy write her story. It's clear to me that the universe and Alberta herself conspired with Adrian to make this lovely piece of art possible, to bring illumination to a difficult time in the world and in our individual lives. So let's end with a poem from this illuminating collection, a poem written by both Alberta and Adrian. You'll be able to tell them apart because in this poem, Alberta's stanzas are the ones that rhyme. This poem, Motherhood, is sort of a culmination of a lot of ideas found within this collection. And it's also the only poem that's written using um, her and my words laid out side by side. She was born in 1882, so her style is a little bit more formal than mine. Um, but we both have very similar ideas about welcoming a baby into the world in turbulent times. Motherhood. A baby fair, a jewel rare, asleep beside its mother. Her face a shine with love divine, unequaled by another. Baby boy cause, quiets humming to a secret soundtrack. He is nothing but details. 
a fairy charm, all pink and warm, brings joy and love and laughter. For mother dear, a comforter here, to have forever after. I press his skin to mine, a pinking thinness between our bloodlines. Has he been passed down from my mother's? The ties that bind, the hearts entwined, are held by that wee treasure. With sweet content, those hearts are bent to make its life a pleasure. How does son plus mother so quickly find its calming sum? O motherhood, the brave, the good, will sing the praises ever. Thy suffering hours, thy mystic powers, will be forgotten never. Never will all the hurt of the world exceed the comfort of this new universe unfolding. Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms, and we also have a Facebook group that you can join, which is the main place for more philosophical discussions about the ideas I'll be discussing on future episodes of the podcast. It's also one of the best ways for you to contribute to future episodes. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. I have big plans for revamping my site this fall, so stay tuned for that. And you can always just email me directly at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.